All right, good morning. Good morning. Happy Tuesday to you. Welcome to the gathering. I'm so glad that you are here this morning. Excited to be in this space for the next few moments to share this to share this moment together. As you're coming in this morning, take a couple of seconds to turn to the folks around you, to look them in the eye, to say, I am so glad that you are here. Put some emotion behind it. I am so glad that you are here. And I'm excited for what's going to happen in this space this morning. Just a few announcements for you as we get started, and then we'll have a couple of students who will share a few more things that are happening. As you know, this is the time of the semester. There are just so many things happening, so I hope you're finding ways to plug in and to be connected. Hope you're checking in with Have You Heard and looking for other avenues of communication to tell you about things that are happening on campus. A few things to make you aware of. First of all, this is the last week to bring donations for our Socktober drive. You can drop off new white tube socks in your residence hall or in the commuter lounge. Singarama. I bet you weren't expecting to hear about that this morning. We're a few months off, but plans are already in place for Singarama 2024 and we want you to be involved. There are a few ways that you can already go ahead and be planning to participate in Singarama, especially if you want to be a director or a host. So applications for Singarama 2024 directors and host positions are now open. For more information, you can check out next Monday's Have You Heard? There'll be all kinds of information inside of there. But you can also scan the QR codes that are on the screen right now for director, and then here in just a moment, there will be a code for hosts. That'll take you directly to the application form, allowing you to take the first steps towards becoming a part of Singarama 2024. Big stuff. All right, next we have Lipscomb University Theater presenting Big Fish, the musical, starting Next week, November 3rd, it runs November 3rd through 12th in Collins Alumni Auditorium. Big Fish tells the story of Edward Bloom, a traveling salesman who lives life to its fullest and then some. Overflowing with heart and humor, Big Fish is an extraordinary musical that reminds us why we love going to the theater for an experience that's richer, funnier, and bigger than life itself. Okay, so here's what you need to know. SGA is sponsoring the first 250 student tickets which makes them free for you. So thanks to SGA for that. Don't miss an opportunity. You can visit lipscomb.edu forward slash theater for more details. Now I've got a few students who are gonna join me on stage to share about a few other things happening this week. Let's welcome Tucker and Natalia and Khalees to stage. Take it away. Let's start with a few things that are happening with Halloween this week. Good morning, everyone. My name is Natalia, and I am a Johnson RA. I'm Tucker, I'm a Sewell RA. And we're here to tell you all about Halloween and maybe how many upvotes it'll get. No, we're not gonna talk about that. But as RAs, we put a lot of effort into Halloween and the events that we do. There's gonna be an event every single night at each dormitory. Last night, we kicked things off with Yeehaw. Shout out to Elam and Fanning for making that event a blast. And tonight is Scare in the Square. Scare in the Square is a huge trunk or treat type party that takes place in the square and you are all invited. So invite your friends, invite your family, and come have a great time. If you're dressing in costume, please remember that it's a family friendly event, so keep that in mind. And if you can't make it, Tomorrow at 9 p.m. at High Rise, we're going to do Haunted High Rise. There's going to be live music, a haunted maze to walk through, and free food for all of you. Then on Thursday, Fanning Hall gets to host Dodgeball, which is arguably one of the best Lipscomb traditions. Y'all know all about it, and you'll love it. Dodgeball begins at 8 p.m. in Fanning, so don't miss it. And last but not least, Friday 
at Bison Hall and the Village. They're doing Hogwarts Halloween. There's going to be Halloween-themed party snacks and games at 8 p.m. So, quick recap. Scare in the Square tonight at 6 p.m. Haunted Wednesday nights we eat tomorrow at 9 p.m. Dodgeball on Thursday at 8 p.m. And Hogwarts Halloween on Friday at 8 p.m. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. All right, let's keep the spooky theme going with a little video. Turn your attention to the screens. It's not about bad stuff, it's a dope song. Get in rhythm. There you go. I can't believe how big they've gotten. Here, Gabe, got a boat. Raw, Daddy! <laughs> He's kidding, right? He is not kidding. Hey, I think it's Coca Clock. Where's Jason? Stick with me and I'll keep you safe. There's a family in our driveway. It's probably the neighbors. Wish I was scared of a family. Hi, right, can I help you? Zora, put your shoes on. If you want to get crazy, we can get crazy. It's us. They look exactly like us. They think like us. They know where we are. We need to move and keep moving. They won't stop until they kill us. And we kill them. got goosebumps man all right Kalise tell us about dodgeball on Thursday night well hey everyone I'm Kalise and I'm a part of the student activities board on Thursday October 26 we are gonna be hosting our dodgeball tournament in Fanning Hall from 8 to 10 p.m. in the past we've only had 16 teams but this year we've expanded the bracket and so if you want to sign up please join our wait list, and then we'd love to have everyone in Fanning, so please come support us. If you have any questions, please email us at sab.lipscomb.edu. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Khalees. You definitely want to show up for all the Halloween activities and show up for dodgeball on Thursday night. I'm going to go ahead and invite our worship team up onto stage this morning. Thankful for Logan and David and Marley for leading us this morning. I'm also going to introduce our speaker for the day, who will get up here in just a few moments and continue our theme on the Beatitudes and explore the Beatitude, Blessed Are the Merciful. With us today is Emily Chapman Richards. Emily is a friend from here in, uh, in the Nashville area, is a former executive director of Show Hope, Show Hope, which is a nationally recognized voice in adoption advocacy and child welf welfare work that was started by her parents. Grammy and Dove Award-winning recording artist Stephen Curtis Chapman, and Mary Beth Chapman, who is a New York Times best-selling author. She has enjoyed watching Show Hope grow from a dream in her parents' heart to an organization that's helped thousands of children come to know the love of a family. Emily is now a consultant while still serving as an advisor and ambassador to Show Hope. She's married to Tanner, and together they're the proud parents of three beautiful ladies. You'll get to see their picture here in just a moment. They are beautiful. So cute. 
Emily is a visionary and a dreamer and has long remained a passionate advocate for adoption and orphan care efforts, which means that she is uniquely equipped to share with us today about our beatitude, blessed are the merciful. What does it mean for us to be people of mercy? And I'm so thankful that she's here to share about that. And especially in light of what is going on in the world around us, I just feel especially compelled this morning for us to take a moment in prayer. As we watch the news and we see what continues to develop and transpire in Gaza, and we think about all of the lives, all the innocent lives that have been ripped apart by violence and by war, and when we think about the good life that Jesus shares about, a life that is full of mercy, I just feel so compelled to pray for mercy, to pray for mercy for the innocent lives who live in that region of the world, to pray for mercy, to pray for the end of war, to pray for peace, and to pray that the God of mercy would come close to his people because we believe that God desires the good life for every single one of his creation, for every son, for every daughter, for every person who is made in his image, that they would experience mercy. And so I'm going to pray for us as I do every week, but I'm going to especially be praying for our neighbors across the world in Gaza in the midst of this conflict. As I do that, I'm going to invite you to stand this morning, and I'll pray, and then we will sing together, and we will prepare our hearts for a word about being people of mercy. God, we give thanks, and we proclaim that you are good because you are a God who is merciful, who loves to give good gifts to your people and to your children. And so God, we want to open our hearts this morning to be moved and to be compelled by your very heart, by your very character. We know that you see and that you know and that you love every single son and daughter who's being impacted whose life is being ravaged by the war in Gaza. So God, would you break our hearts for them? God, we know that you see, that you know, that you love every child who's without a family in this world, as we'll talk about today. And so we ask that you would move compel our heart to look more like yours, that we would be drawn to those who need mercy in the world. And God, I also know that there are people in this room right now who feel like they could use a dose of some mercy. Maybe they walked in with guilt or with shame or with brokenness or with fear. And God, I believe that you want to heap on them good gifts of mercy. Would you do that in the next few moments as we open ourselves up to you, as we invite your spirit into this place? We want to meet you. We want to know you. We want to experience you, the God who loves us, the God who is near, the God who is merciful. It is on that name that we put all of our hope all of our hope for a world that looks more like peace, a world that looks more like justice, a world that looks more like mercy. God, would you come quickly in the name of your son, Jesus, who makes all things come together for good. We pray. Amen. Amen. Well, um, as Brent said, is in, in light of all that's happening in the world, um, we have the opportunity to do what the people of God has always done in the side of these things, um, the opportunity to pray. And then we have the opportunity just to worship. Um, We, we turn to the Lord in times of a heartache like this. And um, 
you know, scripture says the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. And so I can't help but think of the people in the Middle East who are heartbroken. Um, and then those of us who might be heartbroken in here. So let's just draw near to the Lord, um, draw near to his spirit, and uh, let's just worship the Lord, the true Lord. Sing with us. song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus the name above every other Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, we live for you. We sing holy. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you, open up my eyes. heart and lead me in your love to those around me. You sing, I will build my life and I will
God, you are completely sovereign over everything that is happening in Gaza. Lord, you are not surprised by what happened, just like you are not surprised by what happens in our lives. As Lord, so we just submit ourselves to you this morning. And we just say you are holy. Thank you for your mercy to us, God. Thank you for your mercy that is new every morning. We don't deserve it. So we just love you, we praise you, we worship you. It's in the name of Jesus we say, amen. You guys can have a seat. Well, good morning. It is an honor to be with you. My name is Emily Richards. Uh, let us pray. 
Lord, thank you for the time together this morning. I just ask in this time together that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts, O oh Lord, uh, would be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So Brent shared a little bit about me with you, but I'm going to um, add a few more details in, in uh, uh, the about me section. My name is Emily. I am born and raised here, Franklin, married a Franklin native, so I guess that makes us like both unicorns, so I'm told, so that's special. Uh, we met on a blind date at the Starbucks in Cool Springs, so I don't know if that location pops up as a hop in place, but you might want to check it out. It worked out well for me. Um, I am a Baylor Bear. I graduated from Baylor University in 2007. Sikkim, that's right. Thank you. I saw, I saw some of these. I like that. Uh, I graduated in 2007. Tanner and I were married in 08. My undergrad is in international studies and religion. Uh, we met, we uh, yes, we married. There, there's my family. They're so cute. Uh, in 2008 and 2009, Tanner and I moved to Belfast, Northern Ireland. We were there for three years where I did my master's in theology. And the best souvenir we brought home was our oldest, Eileen. Uh, she, came, she came back with us. She was born while we were students there and then has been joined by her two younger sisters, Della and Verity. So to say life is full is an understatement, but I am uh, my, my most prestigious title is Just Mom, bestowed on, my, by, on me by my girls, which I feel very honored to, to hold. Um, standing here, it doesn't feel like it was that long ago that I was sitting in your seat, um, though truthfully it was nearly two decades ago, which makes me feel a little old. Um, but I showed up to Baylor University, a wide-eyed freshman, excited at what was to come, and felt a little uh, weight asking myself the same question that I felt like everybody else was asking of me, and maybe you can relate to this. Well, what are you going to do with your life? What are you going to study? How are you going to use your time and your resources, your passions to serve God, to serve others? Fundamentally, I think the question we all wrestle with, what is our calling? From a young age, I have known that part of my calling is interwoven with a deep passion to advocate for what I call the recovery of the sanctity of childhood, to ensure timely and ethical solutions to permanency for children that are living outside of parental care. And I can pinpoint a moment in my life when um, this passion kind of came online. I had the privilege of traveling to Haiti in the spring of 1997. If you would have asked that really cute 11-year-old version of myself um, what I wanted to be when I grow up, I would have told you I want to be a missionary. And so when the opportunity came to travel to Haiti with a group from church alongside Compassion International to meet um, the child at the time we were sponsoring through Compassion Yvonne, which you can see pictured there, uh, it was really exciting. This trip was my first time to a developing nation, and I met Yvonne, I met many of her friends, and I began to see life through a different set of lenses. Um, I was beginning to wrestle with the fact that so much of what I take for granted, uh, many people around the world uh, lack access to. Shelter, clean drinking water, food, education, family. Yes, those pesky two little brothers were actually a blessing. And so I returned home from this trip to Haiti really impassioned to do something. In fact, I brought my little prompt with me. This is my journal from that trip that I kept. Awesome handwriting. And I wrote in the journal on March 6, 1997, I hope this experience will change my life. I also hope that I will change someone's life. And God was stirring in my heart. I can look back on that time. I'm the proud mom of an 11-year-old now, and I think she's going to change the world. We all do. But I can look back on what was happening in my heart at that time, and it really was a special grace from the Lord working through the Holy Spirit to move our family in obedience to really stepping into living a life um, more fully understanding God's great mercy for us and mercy, extending mercy to those around us. So we, I began praying and um, writing letters. I, I initiated my first letter writing campaign for my family to consider opening our home through adoption. And through a series of events I don't have time to share here, which included a meeting that I called with our senior pastor, 
Uh, the Lord worked in a, in a mighty way, and we found ourselves in China not once, not twice, but three times, welcoming home my younger sisters, Shoei, Stevie Joy, and Maria, who are not so little anymore, college students themselves. I think I have a picture of our young but not but a full family there um, on one side and then a more recent photo on the other side of all of us. My youngest sister Maria passed in 2008 and is waiting for us in eternity so we miss her dearly but um, we are together and actually there's a new grandbaby that just was born last week so that picture is out of date now. Um, through this experience my parents were, uh, we, our whole family we were really captured by the many children and faces and stories that we had come to love and know in our experience traveling around the world. Um, and because of the platform entrusted my dad through music, we had a lot of families coming to us saying, hey, we'd really love um, to open our home through adoption. We have space in our heart and at our table, but we don't have money in the bank account. Process can often cost anywhere from twenty-five dollars to $50,000. And so my parents not... Uh, knowing what was to come started just personally supporting families, and my dad likes to joke, my mom wrote checks faster than he could write songs, and a line started forming, and uh, they started Show Hope, a nonprofit organization in 2003 to offer financial assistance to Christian families that are in the adoption process. They had a 100, I call it the 100 Bridges vision. If we could build 100 bridges between 100 families and 100 waiting children, wouldn't that be incredible with financial assistance? And I stand here 20 years into the work of Show Hope, and I think the next slide shows a little highlight of what we've been able to accomplish through Show Hope. 8,600 children have come home with the help of adoption aid grants, representing more than 60 countries, including the United States. None of that was on our radar, but the Lord had something in store. There's more there, but um, find me afterward, and I'll share more about the work of Show Hope. I've been formally and informally engaged with the work of Show Hope since the very beginning, most recently having served as the executive director. And I stepped back from that role in 2022 to focus on the needs of um, our growing family and the girls in a busy age. Um, but I kind of returned in this season, in this recent season, back to that foundational question that I think we all wrestle with. What is my calling? And I came across these words in Galatians 5:13. I'm reading from the First Nations Version translation. I would uh, commend it to you as a companion in your um, walk of faith. But hear these words, friends. But you, my sacred family members, have been called to walk in freedom. Do not use this freedom to walk in weak and broken human ways. Instead, walk in love and serve one another. You and I, as children of God, our most fundamentally true identity, are free to live a life of service, wherever life may take you. And we live out of the spaciousness of our preciousness before our Heavenly Father. Why don't you think about that for a moment? As I was curious with Jesus, what, if anything, I was to share with you all this morning? And if you don't hear anything else, hear this. Would you tell my friends that my eyes see their preciousness? Would you just tell my friends that my eyes see their preciousness? Dr. Kurt Thompson, a Christian psychiatrist, has written a lot on attachment theory, something that's really important for those of us in the adoption advocacy space as we work alongside children that have experienced adverse childhood experiences. He has this amazing quote, we are all born into the world looking for someone, looking for us. Child development specialists, neuroscience scientists confirm that about the distance a newborn baby can see is about from the cradle of our arm to mom or dad's eyes. That's about what can come into focus. And we're born searching for those eyes. And in the person of Jesus, the eyes of the divine enter into the very raw human suffering and story and look into your eyes and say, do you see? Do you see? You're precious. You're blessed. And that's the scene we enter into in the Beatitudes and into today as we see Jesus confirming his blessing on his disciples and saying, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. 
Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, reflecting on the Beatitudes, writes, Jesus sees his disciples. They have very publicly left the crowd to join him. He has called them, every one of them, and they have renounced everything at his call. They have only him, and with him they have nothing, literally nothing in the world, but everything with and through God. Therefore, Jesus calls his disciples blessed. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. As much of the New Testament is, it is standing on uh, the shoulders of the Old Testament and the Hebrew scriptures. And so the Greek word here for mercy really harkens back to its Hebrew counterpart. It's a word, chesed. I'm probably not saying that correctly, but that's my best attempt. And as I was kind of studying different commentaries for our time together, chesed is, many scholars talk about it being an untranslatable word in the sense that there's not really a counterpart in our English language. It's more than sympathy. It's more than empathy or compassion. It's a reckless commitment to getting into, to entering in, the human story, to living life through the eyes and the lens and in the skin of someone else and trying to really um, bring into oneself, feel in, in oneself what it would be like to live in their circumstances. The fullness of God's mercy comes barreling into the human story with the unassuming birth of Jesus some 2,000 years ago. And I don't know about you, but with everything going on in the world, I'm really desperate for Advent. I really am looking forward to the body of believers saying, hey, Jesus, we're waiting. We're waiting. We're, would you come? And we're going to remember that you did, and we're aching for the day that you will come again. And fundamentally, the freedom to walk in the merciful love of Christ as he put himself in all of his divinity. Scripture tells us he did not count his equality with God, but he left it all to come into the human story right inside of our human existence. This frees us to live a life wherein love is our greatest ethic and mercy our strongest currency. This reality unites you and I. It unites us to those that have come before us in our faith, and it unites us to those that will come after. And the same power, living in the spaciousness of your preciousness before the Father, and motivating you to live a life of mercy, of getting into the raw human stories around you, it's the same power that motivates Mary to sit contentedly at the feet of Jesus, as we see in Scripture, and embolden Zacchaeus to be a fool, act a fool, and climb a tree, and respond to an invitation to lunch with the Father, to the very power that's in the disciples looking in Jesus' eyes right now, knowing that they've abandoned everything, and hearing, catching the vision for what the good life is going to look like, a life of service and dedication and to laying down one's life for others. And it's the same power in the most raw and vulnerable human moment, terrible suffering that the thief on the cross was experiencing next to Jesus, that he recognizes the Messiah's identity and salvation comes to him that moment and that day. That same power is yours, friends. William Barclay offers his own translation. A biblical scholar and theologian offers the following translation of Matthew 5, 7, if he could put it and distill it down into his own words. Oh, the bliss of the man who gets right inside other people until he can see with their eyes, think with their thoughts, Feel with their feelings, for he who does that will find others do the same for him and will know that this is what God and Jesus Christ has done. As opposed to duty or obligation, there is an invitation to freedom found in the abandonment to getting into the very brokenness of the human story and there finding Jesus as he always is working to bring new and resurrection life out of the moment where everybody else said, it's over, death. And if that doesn't motivate you to be a party people, party person, party person, and throw mercy around like confetti into this world because we need it, then my dad would say, he, if he was here, he would do a dad joke and say, well then, if that doesn't light your fire, your wood's wet. Um, and that's, that's true. Like, that motivates us. That's a game. It's not, an, it's not just a game changer. It's an everything changer, as Pastor Scotty Smith said. Let me close with a short story. 
Uh, in 2009, I had the privilege of traveling to Maria's, uh, to China to visit Maria's Big House of Hope. I think I have a picture uh, with me. So Show Hope for a series, uh, for a season of about a decade, we were able to support um, this therapeutic care center here that you see pictured. Uh, we cared for over 2,700 kiddos who had been orphaned with profound intellectual and physical disabilities. Uh, we had to exit that work in 2020 for a myriad reasons. Um, but it was on this trip to, to celebrate the grand opening of Maria's Big House of Hope that we were invited to go down the road to the state-run orphanage. Uh, and to visit the Children's Welfare Institute. And here's a picture from the room. When we walked in, some of the older children were gathered and they were they're looking at a TV that's not in the picture. And I believe uh, from my journal, I went back and read, there's a solar eclipse happening that they're all watching. And what you don't see in this photo is there was a little girl off to the side. Um, her physical, uh, her, her, her posture precluded her from being able to participate. I, I did not... I did not catch what her diagnosis was, maybe cere cerebral palsy or spina bifida. And so I went over, and um, this was, you know, over 10 years ago, and I still, I'm like there right now in my mind. And I, I got down on her level, and we made eye contact, of course, language. Uh, we don't share the same language. I, I don't even catch her name in my journal. I wrote about her and, and, and named her Mercy. I reflect on her, uh, and, and we, we, catch each other's eyes, and we're in this very human moment, giggling, and I don't have anything to offer other than a tissue. And she rolled it up real quick and stuck it to her nose and <sighs> took a deep breath. And I think in that moment was a reprieve from conditions that were less than ideal, smells and sounds, very overcrowded. Um, and it was clear that for some time she had not been tended to. And this floral scented tissue was a moment of reprieve, and she opened her eyes, and I smiled, and she giggled. And in the spaciousness of understanding our preciousness in that moment, she was able to have just a moment of reprieve, and I saw through this moment what it means to be precious in someone's eyes, and that is a gift. That is the gift of entering uh, someone's story, and what seems on the outside looking in, maybe this is a little too hard, this is a little too raw, this is a little scary. We enter in that human story, and we understand uh, how we are seen and loved by God. So be party people, throw mercy around like confetti. May the peace of Christ be yours to share and receive. Amen. I got one. Amen. Will you guys uh, clap for Emily one more time just to give thanks for her words this morning? I just want to share, just while you're here, I, I think some of our most compelling speakers are people who are not only gifted in sharing about the Beatitudes, but from their own lived experience share about how the Beatitudes have impacted their life. And so I'm thankful for, for people like Emily who share about how mercy has compel them to live a different kind of story. May we be people of mercy. May we throw mercy like confetti. Go in peace, friends. Have a great rest of your day. We'll see you soon.